Okay, so Be'ezras Hashem, tonight we're going to be continuing with our series of Shirim on Rabbi Nachman and the possibility of joy. And we're going to be picking up from where we left off last week. Now, last week we spoke about the need to embrace the silliness of this world in the sense of not taking this world too seriously, not taking ourselves too seriously, and allowing ourselves, like Rabbi Nachman told his Hasidim, to be lighter, to float a little more. Because when we're capable of taking this world a little bit less seriously, we free ourselves up to engage in what Rabbi Nachman refers to as mile dishtusa, as foolishness or deliberate foolishness. Now it is very important to make very clear that foolishness is not leitzanus, God forbid. Leitzanus is ridicule. Leitzanus is when a person devalues things of substance by dint of the fact that they're uncomfortable with the presence of that thing. And therefore, the only way to minimize that presence or that kvedut or that heaviness that comes with something that demands our kavod is to be elates about it, is to negate its value. As Rav Huttner explains very clearly in his famous first mimer in Pached Yitzchak on the Yom Tif of Purim. Now, Rabbi Nachman already warns us against this fine line between simcha, in spite of all things, irrational joy that's rooted in a holy abandonment of the mind which embraces the foolishness and the silliness of this world, versus leitzanus. And ultimately, the whole shir tonight is going to be about being masbir, this nekuda. In one of the more famous sipurim, in the Sipurim Maisios Meshanim Kanmonios of the ancient tales, or the tales of ancient days, which Rabbi Nachman decided to bypass the mind and speak directly towards the heart to awaken our neshamos from that slumber of 70 years that we had fallen into, is the Maisa of the Chacham and the Tam. It's a Maisa of this engagement or a, an ongoing conversation, if you will, between two archetypal models of what it means to be a human being. And there are certain Meforshim who have pointed out that there are two elements of each and every person, like the Balhatanya describes in Sefer Hatanya, that we are split between a Nefesh a Bahamas and an Efesh Alikus, a godly soul and an animalistic soul, or as Rav Soloveitchik points out, that each and every one of us has an Adam one and an Adam two within it, or as Rav Kook Sklusiaganalinu pointed out, that he who said that I have a torn soul spoke very well, for there is no human being in existence who is not torn. Now, this duality of the self can also be read into Rabbi Nachman's story of the Chacham and the Tam, that we each have a Chacham in us and a Tam in us. Now, the Chacham of the story is the intellectual, the Tamar Chacham, the Lamdin, who grasps everything, who has a keen understanding of the inner workings of how things are and why things are, and not simply an encyclopedic knowledge that is all but meaningless, but rather a real depth of knowledge and eon and understanding of things and how they work. And the Tam, on the other hand, is the simple individual, not a simple individual who has, God forbid, foreclosed on the value of knowledge, but rather, as Rabbi Nachman teaches us so often, tamimus and simplicity is a simplicity that exists after the end of the road of knowledge and logic. That once a person climbs the ladder towards intellectual prowess and the capacity of the human mind to grasp that which is in front of us through philosophical speculation, through thought experience, there is a step that a person takes where they are finally able to understand the secret of tamimus, the secret of simplicity, and to come to the apex of knowledge, which is the confrontation with that which is unknowable, reminding us that tachlis hayadiyya shalei And in the story of the Chacham and the Tam, which Bezra Sashem at a future date will be able to speak about at length, for Zolcha to give shirim on the Sipuri Maisios themselves, any time the Tom was engaged in anything, he was fully present. The Tom was not bothered by external circumstances in his life. We're told that the Tom was an impoverished shoe cobbler, somebody who worked on fixing shoes, on sewing shoes back together, on working on people's broken shoes, and he couldn't even do that job properly. And as a result, his family lived in an abject state of impoverishment. But when it came time for the Tom to eat, he would say to his wife, he would say, bring me the steak. And his wife would bring him stale bread and he would say, this is the most delicious steak I've eaten in my entire life. 
and he would say, bring me my wine. And she would bring him the lukewarm water that was out overnight. And he would say, this is the most delicious wine I've ever tasted. And he would say, bring me my beautiful coat to pray in. And she would bring him his torn and tattered rags. And he would say, ah, this is how I should be dressed. And it's not that the Tom was playing around. It's not that the Tom was simply pretending, but rather the pretending of the Tom, like we spoke about, the mile de stusa of the Tom, brought the Tom into that state of actually experiencing that which he was pretending to experience. That I've heard from the Talmidim of the Tzaddik and the Goner of Yitzchak Maya Morgenstern Shlita, that when the Tom was eating that stale bread, he was mamish tasting steak. And when the Tom was drinking that plain water, he was mamish tasting yayin. That the avoida of the tam, the avoida of this simplistic willingness to forego on that rational quest to understand and be clear about everything, when we give up on that, we open ourselves up to the expanses of the imagination, to the expanses of pretending that gives us the ability to taste that which we pretend in the moment of pretending. And anytime somebody would come over to the Tam, anytime somebody would come to discuss with the Tam his ways and his derech and avoid the Hashem, the only thing the Tam would say is rak belilet sanas. The only prerequisite, the only condition that I hold dear is that if you approach me, do not approach me with late sanas. Because late sanas, the power of late sanas is the negation of kavod. It's making things meaningless. The abandonment of the seichel that the tam is engaged in, the abandonment of rational thought that Rabbi Nachman demands of us for the sake of finding the possibility of joy within the world that is somewhat joyless, is not a devaluing of value. It's not claiming some postmodern idiom that nothing is meaningful anymore and therefore we have the right to make meaning where we so choose, but whether Rabbi, rather what Rabbi Nachman is revealing to us is that beyond chachma, even above chachma, above the quest of rationality, there exists the space of keser. There exists the space of the irrational desire for HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is more true than rational logic. And so when the Tom pretends, and when the Tom pretends to be happy in spite of all of the reasons not to be happy, he's not being a late. He's not pretending just like a fool. His act of pretending is something profoundly real. And the one thing that he warns against is late sanus. So when we talk about the silliness of being, when we speak about the ability to cast away the laws that dictate our experiences based on the external feelings that we have, and a willingness to descend into that carved out space that is not truly a space within our own hearts to choose how we would like to feel at that very given moment and to allow our own self-certitude to be the anchor upon which our emotional states are rooted, Rabbi Nachman is not claiming to be a late. Adar, adar. Rabbi Nachman is saying this world is most serious and therefore we have to be most serious about not being serious. And so we're not talking about late son as God forbid, but rather we're talking about the capacity to laugh. Now what we're going to look about at, at in this week's shir is very similar to this nukuda. It's very similar to the nukuda of the tam and the ability of the tam to create for himself an experience and an existence that in spite of the fact that it's not true to the world outside of him, is true in his own mind. And ultimately the truth of the Tom's own mind is sufficient enough to become the determining factor of the external truth of his life. In other words, by choosing to think in a certain way, the Tom was creating, so to speak, his own external reality. And this is the Eitzah that we're going to look at tonight, because when it comes to confronting a world where Mara and difficulty like we saw last week is quite literally the most difficult avoida for a person to engage in. That when a person begova enayim with open eyes looks at the world and looks at themselves with a vulnerable honesty for Rabbi Nachman, the natural impact, the natural result is to find a world that is painful, is to find a world where joy is difficult. And the entire purpose of these shirim is to uncover how is it possible for Rabbi Nachman to demand to be besimcha tamid, 
to be in a perpetual state of simcha if on the other hand, on the previous page, Rabbi Nachman tells us that simcha is the most difficult thing to wrestle out of this world. And that in truth, even claiming that there is a world is difficult because for Rabbi Nachman, all that exists is what appears to be Gehenim because everybody in their own hearts is filled with Marish Chayra. And so tonight, what we're going to see is another Eitzah, an Eitzah beyond the Mile Deshtusa. And this is the Eitzah of being in control of our thoughts. And here we're going to have to really discern the delicate boundary between simplicity and complexity. Because Rabbi Nassan has this remarkable linguistic or hermeneutical turn of phrase that he utilizes very often, where he says that the words of Rabbeinu are very deep. They're amuk ma'od, amuk mikol omuk, deep beyond depth. And a person needs to understand and die the maven. And this is enough for those who understand, have a true understanding of these words, implying a certain expertise and wisdom and precision of thought that is demanded to understand these ideas. But then Rabbi Nassim goes on and says that the ikker depth, the depth of the depth is to understand the words in their simple expression and their simple manifestation. Because for Rabbi Nachman, like we said, simplicity is not the negation of depth, but rather it's the depth of depth. That if you dig deep enough into the deeper thoughts that a person is capable of having, what a person comes to is that at the end result, the only truth that exists is how I experience this on a simple level. Because otherwise it remains an intellectual process. The ikker depth, the oimek sheba oimek, the soid sheba soid, the secret of all secrets, is to apply the knowledge of secrets on a practical level. As the Vilna Gon writes in his parish on Mishlei, that the pshat and the sod are interconnected. They're two sides of the very same coin. And that if I can't draw the soid of the soid, the secret of the secret, into actual manifestation and actualization on a level of simplicity, then I am completely devoid of a true understanding of the secret. Because in truth, the secret is fully revealed in front of us. The deepest secret in the world is that there is no secret because everything's a secret. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu's universe and the raw reality that we live with and we find ourselves in on a day-to-day -day basis is the place that we're meant to find HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is the very base medrash where we're meant to encounter God. And so on the one hand, the Eitzah that Rabbi Nachman is going to be showing us collected from Makomos Meshunim, from different places in the writings of Rabbi Nachman, is the simplest of the simplest truths. But on the other hand, it's the deepest of the deepest truths. And a person has to live with that dialectical sway, not satisfy the dialectic, not move from complexity to simplicity and then simplicity to complexity, as if they're two separate concepts, but rather to understand that the simplicity, the simplicity and the complexity are operating in unison in a simultaneous way. That the truth that Rabbi Nachman is being megalatas in terms of how to be besimcha in this world are both the deepest truths in the world and the simplest things to contemplate. And the ikker secret and the main secret is how to live our lives with this. Now the next prerequisite, and this is not something I typically say, but Rabbi Nachman has a teaching in Sicho Saran, and it's brought down in Chaim Aran as well, that when a person is being Mashbia Torah, when a person is giving over Torah, there's a certain mechanism at play in the Segula Satorah, in the spiritual potency that exists within the concept of Torah, that even if a person teaching the Torah cannot live up to the ideas that they are conveying, nevertheless, by conveying those ideas, it gives the person who is listening, as well as the person who is speaking, a certain siyata deshmaya, a help from above, an unearned gift that gives them the capacity to live these ideas more. Because the ideas that we're going to be discussing tonight are ideals. They're ideals that on a personal level I try and live up to, but fail consistently. Yet nevertheless, teaching the ideas is going to be a tefillah at the same time that anybody listening, as well as myself, should be able to properly and truthfully follow the Eitzo Sapshutos, the simple suggestions that Rabbeinu is offering to us. Rabbi Nachman writes as follows in Chaye Maharan, in the 44th teaching in Chaye Maharan. He says as follows, Rabbi Nachman writes, Siper li ish echad me anshe 
There was one of the Hasidim of Rabbi Nachman who came and spoke to me. Shapam Achas Diber Rabbeinu Zichron Avracha Imo Me'inyan Hazeh. That once upon a time, Rabbi Nachman spent time speaking to an individual about the idea that the machshava, the thought of an individual, is biyad ha'adam letafsa biyado ula atoysa kiritsono. That the thoughts of an individual, the thinking process that we go through, is in truth in the hands of the individual to grab it and direct it in the direction that they so choose. The afilu kisha noite machshavta ledvarim acherim oy lehirhurim chas v'shalom. And even when a person's mind meanders into negative thoughts or into destructive thoughts, God forbid, nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, the individual is capable of grabbing hold of that thought and forcing it to return to a positive and healthy thought. Very much like a horse that when the rider finds that the horse is moving slightly off of the intended course, the rider is capable of forcing that horse back onto its intended path. And one of the Hasidim who was discussing this with Rabbi Nachman said to Rabbi Nassim as follows, that Rabbi Nachman in truth described this at length and he explained it a little bit more because this is a teaching that's found explicitly in Lukuta Maharan. But here in Chaya Maharan, as we typically find, there's an expansion and more of a personalized expression of the idea. We're hearing the, the Sicha Schulen, so to speak, the Torah Shabal Peh of Rabbi Nachman, that only Rabbi Nassim had the deep spiritual intuition to record for us here in 2021. So Rabbi Nassim says as follows, the way of thought is that thought should never be at rest. The mind is perpetually moving back and forth, running and returning, up and down, moving from one point to another, as we'll discuss in a second. And it's like the second hand within the watch that is never stopping. That it never stops. There's never a state of the cessation of thought. And even when a person is asleep, the mind is thinking, except thought is a little bit different at night. And the essential point, the reality that for so many of us, it appears next to impossible to control our thoughts or to redirect our thoughts is a fallacy. It's a learned form of helplessness. Because in truth, the human being, the Baal Bechira, is always capable of redirecting their thoughts. But because of the perpetual state of the thought that is moving back and forth from one idea to another, it appears that it's impossible for a person to redirect their thoughts. And it appears to the mind's eye that it's impossible to get rid of these negative thoughts. But the depth of the truth and the truth of the matter is that that at any given moment, I can redirect my thoughts from what they're thinking about at that present moment towards another thought that is completely disconnected from what I'm thinking at that moment. And to redirect my thoughts from a state of negative thinking into a state of positive thinking. So this idea is the mafteya hagadol when it comes to trying to understand how to force ourselves into simcha. Because so often, and more often than not, the very thing that forces us to be sad or to encounter brokenness or marishora is the perception that we have over our experiences. That contrary to popular belief, we do not react so much to the events that take place in our lives as much as we react to our interpretation of those events. And the way that we think is the way that we experience our lives. And because we've thought certain ways for so long, 
because we have been trained or we've convinced ourselves that what my mind is thinking at this moment is an absolute. And if my mind is thinking it, it must be true. So we give in to any thought that pops into our mind and we become enslaved to our thoughts. If at that moment I feel sad, then I'm sad. If at that moment I feel anxious, I'm anxious. If at that moment I feel depressed, I'm depressed. If at that moment I feel bored, I'm bored and so on and so forth with all of the infinite iterations of negative forms of thought. And we give in to this and we live enslaved to this form of thinking simply because our mind is thinking it and we have been convinced over time, consciously and unconsciously, that what is thought is absolute and we cannot redirect our thoughts. And what Rabbi Nachman is describing is that part of the reason for this is the perpetual nature of thought. Now, this is not simply a given. This took, obviously, Rabbi Nachman having a deep insight into the nature of his own thoughts to explain to us because what is the mistaken belief is that thought is something that a person chooses to do is here revealed to be a fallacy that the mind is perpetually thinking. The human being is an Adam that is Choshev, which is why that Adam in Gematria is 45, and that's Chashav Ma. Machshava is the secret of that a human being is thinking, which is the same Gematria as Adam. Ma and Adam is the same Gematria because the essence of a human being is that the mind is perpetually trying to make judgments about experience. But what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us is that the thoughts of the mind are simply what the mind does. And it's with our capacity to break free from those negative thought patterns that we have developed over time and to choose to think in the way that we would like to think, to choose to think positive thoughts in spite of the fact that our natural inclination is to think negative thoughts. Here, Rabbi Nachman is revealing to us the secret that the secret of Bechira is that a person has control over what they're thinking, that a person can emancipate themselves from mental slavery because in truth, no one but themselves can free their mind. Prior to the revelation of Rabbi Nachman that an individual has a very simple time grabbing hold of their thought and choosing to think it differently, we assumed that the jail cell that we're stuck in within these negative thoughts, within these thoughts of marishchera and despondency and anxiety and pessimism and negativity and being overwhelmed and taking things too seriously, that they were sturdy jail cells, that this was a prison that we were forced to live in, the prison of our own thoughts. Comes along Rabbi Nachman and says it's a sheker gadol. It's a deep fallacy because in truth, the human being is capable of shifting their thought at the moment that they choose to put in even the most minimal form of effort. Ah, the next moment the thought reverts back to that negative thought. Okay, so non-judgmentally, you return the thought back to where it came from. And instead of getting involved with the negative thought, you allow that negative thought to be there and you force yourself to think differently. Rabbi Nachman reveals to us that the jail cell, the prison of our thoughts that we felt so stuck in, are in truth made up of the very stuff that gives us the strength to break free. And this secret of thinking and the capacity to break free from negative thoughts is rooted in the deep spiritual conception of Rabbi Nachman understands thought to be. That thought is not simply a way of interpreting the world. Thought is a way of forming the experience of the world. That for Rabbi Nachman and for all of our tzaddikim, the mind is equivalent with the neshama, which means that thoughts are not simply momentary judgments about an external reality, but rather they are the very site in which we form our relationship with reality. This is somewhat of a paradigm shift when it comes to understanding the process of thinking. More often than not, the human being looks at themselves as an individual who lives within a world and is interpreting the world. And so our thoughts are interpretations of what is taking place outside of us. And therefore our thoughts are means to an end. If I think positively, then I will try and feel happy in the outside world. Or if I think good thoughts, then perhaps I will look at the world in a good way. And that a positive thought is meant to lead to a positive action, but without the positive action, then the positive thought is null and void. But comes along Rabbi Nachman and our other tzaddikim, and they teach us the secret of minei ube. This is something we've spoken about in the past in our shiram on Keser. 
in the series on the Sviros and something that will Be'ezra Shashem speak about in the future, something that rests at the core of the systems of many of our tzaddikim, the secret of Mineyu Bey in and of itself. This revolutionary paradigmatic shift is the realization that everything exists within my mind. It's not simply a means towards an end, but rather my thoughts are the means and the end themselves. And that compelling myself to think positively is not simply so that my experience outside of my own mind will be positive, but rather by turning my thoughts around and choosing to think positively, my mind and my experience becomes a positive experience. Because when my neshama dictates what it wants to see, that becomes my reality. Ah, it's not in accordance with what's going on outside of me. It doesn't make a difference whatsoever. Whoever said that my internal reality has to necessarily be in line with what's taking place externally as we're going to see. The secret of thought is what Rabbi Nachman describes so often from the Pesukim in Eov of Achin Ruachu Be'enosh V'nishmat Shakai Tavinem. At the end of Eov complaining and suffering and experiencing all of the brokenness that he had experienced, his friend responds, Achin Ruachu Be'enosh V'nishmat Shakai Tavinem. That in truth, there is a spirit within man. And it is the nishmat shakai, the spirit of shakai, the spirit of Hashem, that gives them the capacity for understanding. Meaning to say that our thoughts themselves are a product of HaKadosh Baruch Hu whispering those thoughts into our mind. Whereas Rav Tzadok and Rabbi Nachman describe elsewhere that the thoughts that I have are a bechina of Ruach HaKodesh, that lecha amar libi bikshu panai as panecha vakesh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the desire that I have in my heart that tells me to seek you out is coming directly from you. And it gives us a, a renewed way of looking at our thoughts. The way I think creates the reality in my mind. Now, this is not some form of magical thinking that says that the way I think dictates what will take place externally, which becomes a very popular idea for many people. Because we don't have control over what takes place externally. The only thing we have control over is the way that we choose to think in the given moment. And what Rabbi Nachman is telling us is that the Iker Nakuda of Bechira is to redirect my thought into a positive thought. That the Machshava is a Kumashlema, that each and every day brings with it its own forms of thought. And if I'm able to be Matapa with those thoughts, I can transform my life into Simcha. As the Arizal and other Tzadikim point out, that the word Machshava that the word machshava itself, thought itself, is the same letters as besimcha, implying that the prerequisite or the tool or the only tool that exists to truly open our minds up to unconditional joy is thought. Because if I choose to think that way, then ultimately that becomes my inner reality and my inner experience. Rabbi Nachman writes as follows in the 10th teaching in Lakuta Maharan, Tinyana. So in the second volume of Lakuta Maharan. Oi, he says as follows, Masha Ilam Rukhaikim Asham Yusparach, the Enemus Kavar Melov Yusparach, Rak Mahma Shainam Yishavadas, the Enemy Ashimatsmum. That the essential reason that a person feels distanced from God in this world is simply because they haven't settled their mind properly and that they don't take the time to settle their thoughts. The Iker and the essential Nikuda in Avoidus Hashem is Lehishtadel Liashev Atzmo Hetiv to take time to calm my thoughts, to be in control of my thoughts, to slow down my thinking. To ask myself, what is it that I'm trying to gain out of this world? Achda, says Rabbi Nachman, but a person has to know that through marishchayra, through despondency, through a tendency towards sadness, that takes away an individual's capacity to direct their mind in the path that they so choose. And therefore, it's very difficult to settle our mind. But through joy, through compelling myself to joy, I give myself the ability to redirect my mind in the way that I would like to direct it. Because the world of Simcha, the world of Bina, is the same world as freedom, like the Pasuk says, Kiba Simcha that through joy I will redeem myself, I will leave that state of constriction. That through Simcha, a person is transformed into a free person, and they have the capacity of leaving the exile of their thought, or emancipating themselves from that mental slavery. And therefore, Kishim Makasha, Simcha Elamoyach. 
when a person connects their mind to simcha and simcha to their mind, when a person chooses to think happily, when a person chooses to act like the Tam and say, I have what I need in spite of the fact that I don't have what I need, that I have enough in spite of the fact that I don't have enough, that I'm happy in spite of having no reason to be happy. As I moich of ben churin. At that point, their mind and their knowledge are freed. And they're no longer in the aspect of exile. And at that moment, a person has the freedom and the capacity to direct their mind in the direction that they so choose. Why? Because now their mind has become freed from exile. And it's only through exile that our mind cannot be settled. Like Chazal have told us that it's specifically the absent-mindedness, that shtusa de alma, that prevents us from ever finding satisfaction or settledness. So again, Rabbi Nachman is telling us another Eitzah here. You want to know how to direct your mind. You want to know how to redirect your mind from negative thoughts, from the natural state of despondency that a person finds in this world. So a person has to compel themselves to joy. And it's only through compelling oneself to joy, through mile dishtusa, through not taking the world seriously, by caring a little bit less about what other people have to say and living in my own self-contained chamber of happiness, that gives me the ability to continue thinking happy thoughts. Rabbi Nachman continues in in a particularly profound teaching. And I have to admit that this is a teaching that I've learned before, but until I learned it last night, it's almost as if I'd never seen it before. They're secret Torahs, like they're secret levels that a person gets to uncover when they're learning the Sefer of Lukut on well, and or not well, but investing in the Sefer that they're goodies. They're almost like hidden chambers that open up within the Sefer and you realize that there's certain Torahs that have never properly been read before. Rabbi Nachman says as follows. So Rabbi Nachman here is going to describe the danger of not being in control of our thoughts the danger of allowing our thoughts to dictate how we should feel, as opposed to dictating to our thoughts what we would like to feel. Rabbi Nachman says as follows. Somebody who lives their lives and they're overwhelmed by these imaginations and they're overwhelmed by these destructive negative thoughts that look at the world and they see despondency or thoughts that direct a person away from the service of God or thoughts that take a person away from what they would like to do in this world, thoughts that drag a person into places in their mind that they don't want to be in, thoughts that force a person to live in the past and mourning over lost opportunities, allowing the mind to be filled with marashchayra, despondency and depression, or thoughts that drag themselves Mm -hmm. into the future where a person is anticipating all the things that can go wrong, living in a state of anxiety and dread over what happens next. When a person gets stuck in these things, When you're involved in the thought, when you've already tried to grapple with that negative thought, you've almost already lost. And the more you try and get rid of that negative thought, the more you try and convince yourself that that negative thought is not true, even engaging in physical embodied states of trying to numb the mind, like shaking the head back and forth, Rabbi Nachman says, those very thoughts themselves that we're trying to free ourselves from will straighten themselves even more and more. And Rabbi Nachman says, because this is the very nature, this is the very truth of how these thoughts work. The more you try and overcome them, the more they're going to chase after you. Why? And listen to this muscle. <laughs> Trying to free oneself with force from these negative thoughts is like a person who is trying to run away from something. But as they're running away, <laughs> At the same moment that they're running away, they're using their periphery vision to look and gaze at that very thing that they're running away from. And because I'm keeping one eye on the thing I'm running away from, the thing that I'm running away from strengthens itself over me. Because I haven't moved my mind away from it. But I've done the opposite. 
that every moment that I'm trying to run away from that negative thought, I'm spending time contemplating where I stand with regards to that negative thought. And by contemplating that negative thought, I become attached to the negative thought. And the havenza, a person has to understand the secret. Because in truth, all we can try and do is get rid of the thought, is not think about it, is choose to think differently, choose to think positive thoughts, choose to be happy in that moment. My mind is filled with destructive thoughts. In that moment, I can close my eyes. I can experience stimu de'enin mechezya de'ha'alma. I can close my eyes from the mirage of this worldliness. And in that moment, I can think a positive thought. Ah, uh, that positive thought has nothing to do with reality. It informs my internal reality. What do I care what the external reality is telling me at that moment? Rabbi Nachman continues and he says that a person doesn't need a person doesn't have to go through all of these severe activities and engaging with the negative thought to try and get rid of it. Kamosha Eitzel Rov Bnei Adam, which is a shtus and a shigayon. Because in truth, all we need to do is ignore those thoughts. The ikr takana, the main thing, is to ignore them, to make sure that we're not allowing our minds to fall into those dangerous territories of sadness. Because sadness is profoundly destruction, destructive. And the more we are stuck in those thoughts of despondency, which become even more entangled with us, the more we try and engage them, the thicker and thicker we are in the stuckness of our lives. But in truth, says Rabbi Nachman, what does a person have to do? A person needs to ensure that we are not paying any attention to the negative thoughts. And that a person should reach a point of simply not caring that those negative thoughts are in front of them. And just continue doing your own thing. In your spiritual activities or in your mundane activities. And do not pay attention to them. Do not give them value. Like I heard from a person who in the middle of their Shemona Esrei, they were stuck with a negative thought. And the more they tried to get rid of that negative thought, the more they got stuck in that negative thought. And he came to a Chacham. How do I get rid of this negative thought? How do I get rid of this Indian of Avodah Zarah that stands in my mind, this difficulty, this despondency, this hopelessness that stands in my mind anytime I open up my mouth to pray? And a Chacham came and said, stop caring about it. He didn't say how to get rid of the thought. He said, stop caring about the thought and pray. Do your thing. Stop caring about what your mind is telling you and choose to think positively. And in that way, that thought went away. In truth, however, what a person truly wants to work on is getting rid of the negative thoughts and the tendencies toward negative thought in an essential way. Every day, every moment that a person lives in this world is its own self-enclosed entity. And if we are capable of directing our thoughts in a positive way today, then that is a day that goes up to Shemayim and goes higher towards the infinite, eternal presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our lives. And in the next moment, if I have a negative thought, that's a new avoida for me. It doesn't say anything about the previous negative thought, which I've been able to be mit'aleh. And this is an incredible teaching from Rabbi Nachman in the 84th teaching in the Kutu Maharan. Based on the Zohar HaKadosh, the Zohar HaKadosh says as follows, and this is the Zohar in Parshas Naso, Daf Kaf Chuf Gimel. The Zohar HaKadosh says as follows. Ta Chazi, come and see. Lishis Yeme Bereshis, with regards to the six days of creation. L'chol Chad Isle Partsufa Dahahu Darga De Anhigle. Each and every moment of existence and each and every person throughout existence has their own particular parts of their own particular lens through which they experience that moment and that reality. And there is no day, there is no moment in existence that doesn't have goodness concealed within itself. But every day also has protective barriers surrounding it from outside. So that not everybody could access that goodness of that day. 
Kagon Choshech de Kasiel in Uhura, very similar to darkness that conceals light. Ubeginda, and for this reason, says the Zayhar, Man de Ihu Chayava Vieil Lamende Raza de Araisa. And for this reason, somebody who is chayiv, someone who has not rectified themselves and they come to understand the secrets of the Torah, how many snakes and scorpions come along to be mebalbel their thoughts, to make their thoughts out of control, to create ruminations, that a person should not be able to access that place. But someone who is good, someone who experiences good, all of these negative snakes and scorpions that push everyone else away are no longer bothering them. And that negative thought, that prevention itself becomes the very site of our positive experience. And we ascend into that concealed good. The Yemran, and they will say, Marana ha barnash toivetzadik vir shamayim boil aile kadmich. And we will announce that there's a good person who's coming to access these experiences. By choosing to think well, by choosing to think good, by understanding that our job in this world is to battle in our mind, is to first and foremost understand that those negative thoughts, the propensity towards thinking negative, is the most natural thing in the world. But our goal is to compel our thoughts into positivity. Rabbi Nachman says in numerous places that the goal of getting rid of negative thoughts and choosing to think positively is not simply so that I protect myself from all of the spiritual dangers that come about through negative thinking. It's not because I'm necessarily worried that my negative thinking is going to lead to negative speech and then negative action, God forbid. But the very sight of Bechira, the very sight of what it means to be a human being is to engage in the rectifications of negative thoughts and to recognize that we have the freedom of choosing how to think. Rabbi Nachman goes on and says something remarkable. He says that the tikkun to a negative thought, that the very rectification of a negative thought is having that negative thought again, but compelling oneself not to think that way. Because the pain and the intensity and the mindful awareness that is demanded for a person to grab control of their thought is almost on a certain level more intense than the pleasure that they had experienced from that negative thought. That the goal is fixing the thought. That's all we're supposed to do. We're supposed to speak positively to ourselves. We're supposed to believe in the good of this world in spite of the appearances that say otherwise. This is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us, that the freedom to find joy in this world exists within the very mind itself. Rabbi Nachman says something absolutely incredible. What happens when a person finds themselves stuck in Marish Chaira. What happens when a person finds themselves stuck in these negative thoughts and they can't seem to be miskaber over them? Rabbi Nachman says something that's almost difficult to say, but because Rabbi Nachman wrote it, so we know that we're able to say it. And this is a teaching in Chaya Maharan. And this teaching in Chaya Maharan is Tav Kuf Tzadi, 590. Rabbi Nachman says as follows. That somebody came to him once and asked him, what in the world do I do with my negative thoughts? What should I do with these negative thoughts that assault me, that make it difficult for me to choose to think positively, that make it difficult for me to redirect my thinking? And Rabbi Nachman says, you should look at these thoughts themselves as a kapara. You should look at these negative thoughts as a way of being mamtik, as sweetening that very negative experience that you find yourself in. And then Rabbi Nachman laughed and he smiled. Rabbi Nelson writes as follows. So in truth, it appears that the smile was because there was a depth to this teaching that wasn't being revealed. But then he continues and he says, nevertheless, there's truth to the words of Rabbi Nachman. Because I'll call upon him at the end of the day. Someone who experiences negative thoughts, someone whose cognitive process is filled with anxiety or sadness or temptation or all of the thoughts that pull us out of this world. But at that very moment, instead of complaining to God and saying, why are you sending me these thoughts? They accept those thoughts as what is present in that moment. In that moment that they don't fight against Hashem, 
Yodea bevade Hashem Yisbar Chorotza lekarvu lekabel tfilaso. It's clear to that individual that in this very moment, these thoughts, these negative thoughts, are a reminder that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to come closer to Him, except that these negative thoughts are preventing me, and the pain that I experience, the pain that I experience as a result of these thoughts, Yacholiyos bevadai, it's certainly possible, by learning to accept our thought non-judgmentally, to say, well, that's an interesting thing that my mind wants me to go there. It's an interesting thing that instead of thinking about A, my mind wants me to think about the B through Z. But by accepting that and not fighting against it, in that moment, I recognize that I have the ability in my own mind to choose to think positively because now I'm seeing these thoughts, these negative thoughts, as a positive message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to come closer to him. Similar to something that Rabbi Nachman brings down earlier, one of my favorite stories, that the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh once lit his pipe with a candle that had a shash of being used with, made out of non-kosher animal fat. And the Baal Shem Tov lit his pipe and then he davened Shemona Esrei. And the entire Shemona Esrei, the Baal Shem Tov was losing his mind, so to speak, over the shash, over the suspicion that he may have been over an Isser. Now, it wasn't an Isser, but it would have been a Midas HaChasidus that the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh didn't want to go against. And Rabbi Nachman writes in Tav Kufnun Beis and Chaim Aran that after Shemona Esrei, what did the Baal Shem Tov do? The Baal Shem Tov was makabal upon himself to always light his lulka, to always light his pipe with that very candle. That very candle that created that Marash Chayra for him in his Shemona Esrei. Because what the Baal Shem Tov was showing and Rabbi Nachman was giving Eitzah to is we have the power to be miskaber over those negative thoughts. We have the freedom to think as we so choose. And as Rabbi Nachman tells us in numerous places that there's no two thoughts operating in the mind at once that it's as simple as shifting my mind from one thing to another, acting like the Tam, believing that I have the power in my mind to create the Simcha. If I choose to think that way, that becomes my reality. And this is what Rabbi Nachman tells us, that La'asid Lavro, in the future, Tzadikim Yoishvim Ve'itroseihem Biroshehem. This is in the 21st teaching of Lukutamaran. Then in the future, the Tzadikim will sit and their crowns will be in their head, Biroshehem. And Rabbi Nachman asks the kasha, which we've discussed in previous shirim, why not say al roshehem? Shouldn't the crown be affixed atop the head? Why is the crown affixed within the head? And the truth of the matter is, says Rabbi Nachman, that the machshava of the person is the very sight of the person's experience. And if I choose to think powerfully, that is my Gan Eden, that is my atara in my mind. That the freedom of our mind is that we are the ones who are capable of choosing how we would like to think at any given moment. To end, what we're going to look at is teaching, I believe it's Kuf Nun Gimel in the Kutta Maharan. I'm sorry, it's Reish, Reish Lamed Gimel. Reish Lamed Gimel. Rabbi Nachman says as follows, and Rabbi Nachman is describing here that in truth, the battle that is engaged in the mind of every individual between the positive thought and the negative thought and trying to overcome with our Bechira to choose to think positively in that moment, which ultimately creates our reality in that moment, is the Iker Tachlis of Bria. Rabbi Nachman says as follows, that when negative thoughts and destructive thoughts are awoken within the mind of an individual and a person tries to overcome them and a person spends their time trying to be victorious over those thoughts. There's a profound level of pleasure, so to speak, that a Kaddish Baruch Hu experiences, specifically that emerges out of the darkness of this world. That's the Tachlis of Bria. And it's beautiful in the eyes of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's valuable. And the metaphor is that there are certain times where on days of celebrations for kings, they gather together different types of animals, and these animals fight against one another. And the king stares and watches, and it creates a deep level of pleasure for the king to witness the victory that emerges. 
The same is true with regards to the thoughts that come into a person's mind, that in truth they're mamish like these animals, that holy thoughts are kosher animals, and unholy thoughts are destructive, negative thoughts are unholy animals. And the two of them are left to battle with kavana from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so that one should overcome the other. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a profound level of joy and pleasure when the individual puts in enough effort to overcome those negative thoughts. And the simplest klal says Rabbi Nachman, that in truth, that Rabbi Nachman is stating a cognitive halacha, that it is impossible for a person to have more than one thought operating in the mind at any given moment. And therefore it's very simple to get rid or to dispel these negative thoughts. I don't even have to put in effort. I simply stop thinking that thought. Stop thinking it. And to choose to think something differently in Torah, in Avoda, or even in Mile de Alma, in because it's impossible for the mind to maintain those two different thoughts, that cognitive dissonance. If I'm experiencing negative thoughts, then I can simply choose to be besimcha. And it, this is the first etza, or the, really the second etza. The third etza, perhaps. The first etza is to learn how to not care, like we discussed two weeks ago. The second Eitzah uh, that Rabbi Nachman is offering us in the fight for Simcha in a world where Simcha appears to be absent is going to be to look at the world with eyes of silliness, to be able to laugh at the world. The third Eitzah uh, that we're seeing tonight is the power of our capacity to direct our thoughts. Next week, Be'ezra Sashem, what we're going to discuss is going to be a fourth Eitzah, uh, which is going to be thinking in the very present moment thinking and looking at the world one moment at a time, one day at a time, not looking at yesterday, not looking at tomorrow, and living in the present moment, which is the only site that we have the capacity of drawing simcha down, Be'ezrus Hashem.